Hello everyone and welcome to another Wirt Electronic ISOS webinar. My name is Markus Ebele and I will moderate this webinar today. We are very, very pleased that you took the time to participate in our webinar. The topic of today's webinar is LED driving and dimming. Our speaker today is Alexander Zeller, who has been working as application engineer in the field of magic power at BA ISOS for many years. He will hold today's webinar and also answer your questions. As we also take all possible steps against the coronavirus to heart, we are unfortunately not sitting in the same rooms today, but are holding the webinar from different locations. In case of technical problems, please take this into account. We will do our best to make a smooth process possible. Before we start the webinar, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the webinar today. This means that you cannot ask us questions via microphone during the webinar. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask us questions during the webinar at any time via the chat function. You will find the chat function in the webinar control panel. The webinar will be about 30 minutes long. The chat questions will then be answered in a question answer session following the webinar. There are 10 until 15 minutes in addition scheduled for this. If we are unable to answer all your questions within this time, we will answer them via email after the webinar. If you still have any other questions left after the webinar, just email us at isos-webinar at ve-online.com. Uh, we will try to answer all questions promptly. At the end of the webinar, you will be asked to participate in a feedback survey. We, will, we would be pleased if you take the time to fill out the survey and help us to improve our webinars. The link to the recordings of today's webinars, as well as the presentation, will be sent to you in a separate email several days after the webinar. You can also watch the recordings of today's webinars of today's webinar a day later on our website under the navigation point webinars or on our with electronic YouTube channel. Now I will hand over to our speaker Alexander Zeller and I wish you an exciting webinar. Yeah, thank you, Marcus, uh, for that short introduction. Hello as well from my side, and welcome to my webinar about LED driving and dimming, made simple with uh, our magic power modules. So first of all, let's have a look about the uh, at the table of contents. Uh, I will uh, start with the different possibilities for dimming LEDs. Afterwards, I will show you the benefits of our magic LED driver and how it works. And I will also show you some solutions for higher current and the special features of our multicolor reference design. At the end, I will give you a short introduction about our new lighting development kit. So let's start with the different dimming possibilities for LEDs. To begin, we need to understand how dimming of LED works. LEDs are current controlled, so the voltage across the LEDs is automatically adjusted according to their nonlinear diode characteristics. Most LEDs have a forward current of 1.8 to 3.2 volts. And there is an almost linear relationship between the radiated power and the current. Therefore, the luminous flux depends also on that forward current. As you can see in the diagram, less current through the LEDs results in less luminous flux and therefore lower brightness. This is expressed in lumens. The color of an LED depends on the current flowing through it. If the absolute current through the LED of a certain color changes, the wavelength of this color also changes slightly up to about 20 nanometers. So this doesn't mean that a blue LED turns red, of course, uh, but it can get a darker blue, for example. So let's move on to the different dimming methods. Uh, there are analog dimming, dimming with pulse width modulation or pulse frequency modulation, and the combination of analog and pulse width modulation available to use. With analog dimming, the change in brightness is done by simply lowering the forward current through the LED. During the picture, the lowering of the current is shown. 
with 100% current, we have 100% brightness. With 80% current, 80% brightness, and of course, with 20% the same. So this can be done via variable forward resistance, for example, a potentiometer, or an adjustable uh, source, as you can see in the schematic on the right. Since we have a resistor here, the efficiency is, of course, also quite low. But because no switching elements are used, uh, no EMC measures need to be taken into account. So that's the good point of it. The disadvantage of analog dimming is that the color from the LED can shift due to the lower absolute forward current, as I just mentioned, of, with about 20 nanometers in the wavelength. Now let's have a look at dimming with the pulse width modulation, or PWM for short. The forward current of the LED is pulsed while dimming. This means that the same current always flows through the LED and the color of the LEDs does not shift. The brightness is determined by the duty cycle, which is shown in the picture. The frequency is always constantly the same here. For 100% brightness, we don't need to pulse the current. But for a brightness of 80%, for example, uh, we need a duty cycle of 80% on time and 20% on time, as you can see in the middle here. If you want an even lower brightness, for example, the 20% on the right, uh, we also need to change the duty cycle to a 20% on time and the 80% off time. The efficiency for PWM dimming is quite high because we don't need a resistor here, of course. Due to the pulsation of the current through the LED strings, uh, which can be pretty long, for example, three meters, uh, the EMC must always be kept in mind. In addition, a controller is required to generate the PWM clock signal. Uh, this can be done, for example, with a microcontroller. The pulse frequency modulation, PFM for short, is similar to the PWM. Here, the current is also pulsed through the LED and the color shift is avoided. In contrast to the PWM, the brightness of the LED is changed with a constant on time, but a variable frequency. This is also shown uh, in the picture. So basically, we also have a duty cycle of 80% for 80% brightness uh, in the middle. But since the on time is constant, the frequency needs to be higher for a shorter off time. For a brightness of 20%, the frequency needs to be lower, that the on time is now only 20% of the duty cycle. This means that the off time is variable and set by the frequency. If the minimum frequency is not selected high enough, the LEDs will flicker visible at low brightness. So here you need to have a look uh, at the lowest possible frequency, otherwise you can have a visible flickering. The efficiency for PFM dimming is uh, high, just as the PWM. Also, the EMC has to be considered even more by pulsing with uh, different frequencies. We got a higher spectrum, of course, because we're dimming with different frequencies. A control unit is also required, just like the PWM. So, in a microcontroller, for example. The combination of analog and digital dimming mainly combines the advantages of both methods. The forward current through the LED is lowered, like with an analog dimming, from 100% to 30% in our example. Afterwards, the PWM will become active and pulse the current with a constant value of the 30% of the current. Thus, the color of the LED shifted only minimally, because the upper current range is not as color sensitive as the lower ones of the LEDs. The efficiency here is a bit higher than with analog dimming, but worse than with a pure double. Uh, worth with pure PWM dimming. In the analog dimming range, again, new, no EMC measures are required. <clears throat> EMI is only critical in the PWM range, since the pulse current has only a small value here, the power is lower, and of course, also less can be radiated. This also means that uh, less EMC measures are required. So we need a, a smaller filter, basically, here than with a pure PWM dimming. The control is much more complex because uh, not only a PWM signal is generated, but also because the analog dimming circuit has to be controlled. An additional controller must be implemented which measures the current value and activates or deactivates the PWM control when the threshold value, or example, the 30% is met. So it's a bit subjective, but uh, if you compare the dimming variance in terms of color shift, efficiency, EMC, flicker, and control, you get the following result. 
The analog dimming has the highest color shift of the LED. Here we can reach the 20 nanometers shift of wavelengths almost. While the PWM and PFM dimming do not show any shift. With the combination, a slight color shift is also still possible. <clears throat> the efficiency for analog dimming is quite low compared to the high efficiency of the PFM and PWM. This is caused by the resistor, of course. And the combination is in the middle of both methods. The analog dimming scores best in terms of EMC, but minor filter measures must be taken for the combination. The PWM and PFM should be definitely considered more closely. Here high, uh, can occur high interferences. A visible flicker can occur with wrongly selected frequencies with all the methods except the analog dimming, where flickering is always avoided due to the fact that we don't pulse the current. <clears throat> From a frequency of approximately 100 Hz and upwards, the human eye can no longer perceive the pulsation, so the LED appears now darker with a lower duty cycle due to the interior of the human eye. Uh, for camera applications, uh, the dimming frequency should be selected uh, about uh, 1000 Hz or better 2000 Hz to avoid the flicker in here. The control is very easy with the analog dimming, while with PWM and PFM a more complex control system is needed. The combination has here the most complex control requirements, as I just mentioned. But at the moment, uh, PWM is still the best method for dimming LEDs because of the color shift and the uh, bad efficiency of the analog dimming, for example. And of course, uh, the EMI is also easier to handle than with PFM, since we have a lower frequency spectrum. So what benefits does a customer have with our magic LED drivers? Compared to discrete solutions, uh, we got faster development cycles because all components are integrated in one package. Here in the middle, you can see our uh, LED driver. It's a TO263 uh, ca casing with a size of uh, 10 to 10 millimeters. And all the red marked components are in that uh, little casing. So therefore, we got also a compact solution science. And since we have a exposed pad on the bottom for a good ground connection, we got also a simple thermal design because it also helps for the heat dissipation. Our LED driver has also in some integrated protection functions, just as the anti-voltage lockout or thermal temperature shutdown. So if it gets overheated, it shuts down. Additionally, we got uh, some protection functions for the LEDs as well, which I'll come to later. In our data sheet uh, or in reference design notes, we give all the EMC actions which need to be taken into account. So you just need to read it, implement it, and you should handle it. All the dimming methods I just mentioned uh, from the pages before are available with our LED driver. It has a higher efficiency of up to 95% with a wide input voltage range of 4.5 to 60 volts and up to 450 milliamps per driver. Our LED driver is very easy to implement. Uh, only up to five steps are necessary to complete the design. The necessary steps are to set the output current via resistor here on the bottom right. The resistance can be calculated with the formula from the data sheet. It's also quite easy. Additionally, if you need a current of 350 milliamp, you can also just use the IFIX pin because therefore the resistor is even integrated in the module. You just need to connect it to ground. Second point is that the number of LEDs must be selected to adjust the input voltage. The third point is to select the appropriate EMC components, like an input cap for a low impedance connection and the output cap for a low ripple. You can find even more EMC instructions, as I just said, in our data sheet. Optionally, the desired dimming variant can be selected. And finally, several LED drivers can be connected in parallel, which I will explain a bit more later. But how does our LED driver work? If you now look at the simplified topology of our LED driver, you will notice that at first glance, it looks like a normal buck regulator. But a closer look shows that uh, we have a floating buck topology because the inductor is on the ground side, just like the MOSFET. In the picture, it's on the top. So the cathode of the LEDs is not connected to ground, but to the inductor and the switching MOSFET. The complete input voltage is therefore always present at the anode of the LEDs. The current of the LEDs is measured via an integrated sensor system and compared with the internal reference. 
Thus, a constant current regulation scheme is integrated in our LED driver. During the on time in the MOSFET, uh, during the on time, the MOSFET is closed. Uh, the red loop is the on time current path of the LEDs. Here, the energy is stored in the inductor and the output cap is charged. In the off loop, when the MOSFET is open, the polarity of the coil inverts, so the inductor inverts, and it acts as a source. The current flow here now occurs via the diode. The LED driver can be controlled directly via dim pin. It is then switched on or off depending on the applied signal. As I already mentioned, the LED driver has uh, LED protection features. With the short circuit protection, the current remains constant at the set value even if an LED has a short circuit. The voltage across the LEDs decrease automatically within 50 microseconds as you can see in the graph here. In our example, we have six LEDs with three volts and 350 milliamps. So the input voltage is 18 volt. If now one LED would be a short circuit, five LEDs with 18 volt could be already damaged or even destroyed. And with our LED driver, the voltage therefore is reduced to the 15 volt. Our LED driver has an integrated failure protection as well. So if the current flow through the LED is interrupted, the LED driver switches off and the voltage uh, at the LED plus pin jumps to V in. This allows uh, failures to be detected by monitoring the LED voltage. But what should we do if we need uh, more than 450 milliamps uh, of one LED driver? There are many solutions uh, for higher current. You can use our LED driver, also known as LDHM, for LED step down high current module in parallel. You can also use our 1.5 amp magic LED driver with the QFN41 module or our magic current source with our LGA60 module for up to 3 amps. The webinar from Roland Kratz uh, describes how any power module can be used as a current source, allowing even for further customization for applications. You can find that webinar on YouTube or via this link when you receive the presentation later on. So as I just mentioned before, the LED driver can be connected in parallel. So this is pretty easy. So you just need to connect the output pins after the output cap here in red for the plus polarization together and at this point to the LEDs. For the LED minus, of course, it's the same. Connect them together after the output caps and then go to the LEDs. Each LEDHM controls its current dependently. So you can set both to 450 milliamps, for example, that you receive uh, 900 milliamps, as you can see in the graph here. Uh, or you can set one to 300 milliamps and one to 400 milliamps for a total of 700 milliamps. This is caused by the internal uh, sense resistor, of course. For our 1.5 amp LED driver, I will just skip the electrical specifications. You can just find them on the page here. And for the features, we got also a PWM or uh, analog dimming. And additionally, we got an enable and disable function, or basically it's the same as our LED driver. Additionally, we got the power good signal here, which uh, helps to monitor a failure of the LED strings. The design was uh, designed like that, that you can SMD pick and place it directly onto your PCB. You can find uh, all the GABA files, Altium files, and everything you need, technical documentations on our website for download. The magic current source is another re reference design, which can be used as an LED driver. I will also skip the electrical specs here. Uh, the LGA16 module allows an additionally maximum voltage limit. So therefore, it can also be used for super cap charging, for example. So it's not a feature you need for LED driving, but you can use it for other stuff as well. The dimming is also possible via PWM or analog, just like the designs before. Here you can also find our files on our homepage. So what are the special features of our magic multicolor reference design now? Here we got four parallel independent channels, the, which are even EMI compliant to the lighting norm, the EN55015 and the industrial norm EN55032, 
during dimming. So you can see here in the graph that we are for the radiated emissions with an input voltage of 24 volt and an output current of 450 milliamps at 80% dimming ratio, uh, still 20 dB microvolt per meter uh, away from the limit. The dimming here is possible via push button or a potentiometer on our separately available user panel, as you can see in the middle, or with the blue little chip here, it's an onboard Bluetooth module uh, via mobile app. At the moment, the mobile app is only available for iOS, but the Android version will follow soon. Here we choose uh, the dimming method with the pulse width modulation, and therefore the design is made for flexible fields of replications. You can just use it for um, horticulture, for example, food lighting, or just general lighting. The PCB was optimized uh, thermically, so even if every channel is on maximum power, the components won't get hot, so you also won't burn your, burn your fingers. <laughs> so viewed as a block diagram, uh, it shows that the input voltage here of 48 volts uh, going to the LED drivers directly. But it's also regulated to 15 volts here via our QFN41 module. The 15 volt is needed for the LED drivers when the number of LEDs is less than 6 and the input voltage is 48 volt. Via LDO here, the uh, 15 volts is also converted to the 3.3 volt to supply the Bluetooth module and the microcontroller. The microcontroller controls the, the signals from the user panel, so there we got the potentiometer and the push buttons on, and also converts the UART from the Bluetooth module, which gen, uh, gets the signals from the mobile phone, of course, uh, to the corresponding PWM signals for the LED driver. So why can we use an LDO here? It's easy because we got only a load of 20 to 30 milliamps. So if we have a look on the board itself now, um, can have the input voltage of 18 to 48 volt with an output of 1.8 to 48 and up to 450 milliamps of course per channel. In yellow marked here, I hope you can see the mouse, um, we got all four LDHMs. So there are the four different channels. In green marked, we got the VDRM, our QFN41 module for the 15 volts. The purple marked uh, microcontroller is a PIC16 microcontroller, which either converts the gray marked uh, signals from the Bluetooth module here, or from the user panel, which can be connected here, and generates the PWM signals for the LED drivers. With those switches, we can uh, either turn the channels off to 15 volt or V in. As I just mentioned, it's good if we uh, break down the voltage to 15 volt if we have left less than six LEDs, for example, when we have an input voltage of 48 volt. Additionally, we got here an input filter for the conducted EMI, and at the output, we got a filter for each channel for the radiated EMI to comply with the norm, even with the long wires of up to three meters. Also, of course, every channel has its own uh, screw terminal as the input voltage as well. We now have a look at the single output channel. Uh, I will skip the electrical values. You can just find them in the table. Uh, we have an additional input filter. This filter is to decouple the LDHMs from the other LDHMs that they don't disturb each other. Here we got two electrolytic, electrolytic caps and an inductor, and afterwards a little uh, input cap for low impedance uh, connection for a LED driver. At the output, we change the output cap to a polymer cap. So usually we use an MLCC here, but MLCCs can have uh, piezoelectric effects with the high ripple, and so they can vibrate and you hear the noise. With a polymer cap, you don't have this uh, noise. L2 and L3 are chip beat ferret uh, for a differential mode interference, so high frequency differential mode interference. And uh, with C3, we got also uh, high interference frequencies shorted. After the little MLCC with three, uh, C3, we got a common mode choke with L4, which is for a low frequency common mode interference. Afterwards, you can put just your LEDs there. So this design is made for, as I said, cables with up to three meters. 
So now let's have a look at our new lighting development kit. So what's our lighting development kit? Basically, it's an all-in-one set for horticulture and RGBW lighting. Um, in our beautiful red box here on the right, there is a controller. So the reference design I just mentioned is in there. The power supply, the LEDs, heatsink, lenses, so different lenses even. Um, the cables, everything you need, basically is a plug and play box. Also the technical details are described precisely in the quick start guide and in the reference design note. As I also already said, our We Illuminate app is uh, at the moment available free of charge uh, from the iOS store and Android is following soon. And all in all, it's to say uh, the kit is just ideal for startups and interested developers which will have a first look into the lighting business or even the horticulture, of course. So if you want more information about uh, Magic Power Modules, you can find them on our homepage or directly from your responsible sales representative. They will help you, of course. And if you've got support requests, also technical, you can mail them directly to our hotline, powermodules at we-online.com. And thank you for your attention. So thank you, Alex, for this great webinar. Now we would like to turn our attention to your questions and wait a little while until some questions have come in. In the meantime, I would like to draw your attention once again to the fact that in a few days you will be able to view the webinar again on our website and also on our YouTube channel. After this webinar, we will also send you an all, doc all documents in a separate email. So now we would like to turn our attention to the first questions and we have got the first question. So Alex, what is the difference between the norm EN55015 and EN55032? Yeah, so basically the EN55015 uh, has a wider frequency measuring range. So. The range starts here at 9 kilohertz instead of the 150 kilohertz from the industrial norm. So therefore we can say the industrial norm is just included in the lighting norm because the limits for both are basically the same or they are the same, not basically. <laughs> okay, so the next question also has come in. Um, why do I need a low impedance connection for the LDHM? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, the LDHM is a switching regulator, um, which is based on a buck regulator. So it drains high pulse currents from its V-in pin. And because of the low impedance connection, so basically a cap close to the V-in pin and the exposed pad ground, uh, those pulse currents will be drained from the input cap instead of the source itself. And that way, the pulses also won't go through the long wires of the PCB and can't, radi can't radiate disturbances there. Okay, so thank you, Alex, for this answer. Um, we also got the next question. It's about um, how does the LDHM driver adjust the voltage automatically? Yeah, well, uh, the LDHM drives the current, so the voltage is set by the load based on the, the current voltage characteristic of the LEDs. So it doesn't adjust the voltage automatically. It's just because it drives the currents, the voltage is set from the LEDs. Okay, thank you. Um, we also got the next question. Why can I use a MLCC instead of a polymer capacitor without dimming? Um, yeah, well, um, MLCCs are cheaper, of course, and uh, without dimming, we don't have that high rip, uh, of ripples or interferences. Therefore, also piezoelectric, effect, piezoelectric effects um, won't occur in the regular operation. It's just the same for every LED driver, uh, which is used in that kind of application. Okay. So the next questions we've got is about um, how many LEDs can be driven with this LED driver? This depends on the input voltage, of course, and uh, on the LED voltage. So since we have different LEDs from 1.8 to 3.2 volt, um, you can just divide 
the input voltage through the LED voltage of one LED, and then you get the amount of uh, as result. For example, with our LDHM, we have 60 volt for maximum voltage, and we can drive there up to 18 LEDs with 3.2 volt each. So this should be around 58 volts uh, in total, and therefore we got still some uh, space for losses. Okay. Alex, thank you for these answers. So it seems that there are no questions left anymore. So if you have still questions, we will also answer them via email afterwards. So you're always welcome to answer us. Yes, um, now we are finished with our webinar. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed our webinar. Also, many thanks to you, Alex, for this great webinar. Thank you as well. I hope, I hope we will hear us at our next webinar again, and I wish you a good day. Goodbye.